Hey guys, tonight we did chapter 11 with the kids, um, which is uh, Little Faith in the Flatterer, um, in the abbreviated version for the modern version, we're looking at finishing chapter 10, and then the, the first two sections of chapter 11, so pages 173 to about 178. And then for the Banner of Truth version, if that's the one you're reading, it's, it's pages 145 to 157. So there's basically three high points or three main sections of this um, uh, chapter, and that is first the story about little faith, and then you have the ensnarement of the flatterer, and then you have the laughter of atheists. And so if you remember from last last week, the chapter ended with um, Christian and Hopeful looking at the um, the the man who was in shame being led away by. I think seven de devils, uh, and he was uh, ensnared with these cords being led away, uh, and they were taking him to the door that, that led to hell. That was close to the end of the, the way, the path to the celestial city. And um, and so in that context, then, after seeing his name, that guy's name turned out was Turnaway from uh, the town of of apostasy. So Turnaway is um, obviously the, the, the picture of turning away from God. And so that leads to this story about uh, little faith from Christian. And uh, so the fundamental thing, one of the main things really emphasized with the kids is that there's a difference between no faith and little faith. Um, you know, no faith is, is not believing in God, not trusting him at all. Little faith is uh, just a small amount of it. And, and think about through the Gospels. We've even seen with Pastor Josh and the Gospel of, uh, going through the Gospel of Luke, you know, like at the calming of the, the storm, you know, Jesus gets up. What does he say to his disciples is, uh, O ye of little faith. Um, but again, that's substantially or, or fundamentally different than O ye of no faith, okay? I mean, there's a whole nother thing when the unbelief is at that level. So I think that's an important thing to see that's being emphasized. But little faith is this pilgrim. He falls asleep probably because of neglect in a, in a place he shouldn't have, but he falls asleep and he's attacked by three robbers. The three robbers are faint heart, mistrust, and guilt. So faint heart is... Uh, I told the kids it's the opposite of brave heart. Uh, so, you know, it's lacking courage, losing heart, uh, being overwhelmed with life. And, and again, obvious attack on our faith that we all have to deal with. Uh, mistrust uh, is, if we were to translate that in our day and age, would probably be anxiety. Um, you know, things that cause us to doubt the goodness of God. You know, and we can look at Matthew 6, 25 to 34. I'm not going to read it, but, you know, there, how many times does he say, you know, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. God takes care of the birds. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. Seek first the kingdom. Um, but I think, you know, more to the point or a more concise way of, of emphasizing this is, is reading Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so, you know, there we kind of just see is, is, is recognizing the presence of God and taking our, 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 the things that worry us and concern us and bringing them to God is is the thing that what leads to peace and so again anxiety is one of those things it's kind of like depression uh, you know depression often is a result of, of unrepentant sin but it's not always you know it's one of those things that you know often dealing with sin biblically helps with depression but you can't say that's always the case same thing with anxiety, uh, you know, often dealing with anxiety biblically deals with 
these issues. But again, there can be other factors that, that affect things. But mistrust, anxiety, it, that's a huge attack on faith that we all have to deal with. Uh, and then the last one is guilt. And so, and I tried to emphasize with the kids that there's a difference between false guilt and true guilt. Uh, guilt is not a bad thing in that if we sin against God, uh, we ought to feel guilty. And so if we sin and we hurt people, we sin against God, and we don't repent, like, like the problem is if we don't feel guilty. That's a bigger problem than feeling guilt then. Because true guilt is like that that um, check engine light that's coming on to help us recognize something is wrong. We need to deal with it. And um, whereas false guilt is when, you know, if we've, if, you know, we've confessed our sin to God, we've repented. Uh, if we hurt other people, we've dealt with it. We've not just ignored it. And, um, and so if at that point guilt comes in, that's a false guilt. And, and again, false guilt is an attack on, on faith. And so little faith, he's attacked by these three things. Um, but, and they take all his spending money that they, they leave as, they, they can't find his jewels, is how it's described in the book. And again, pointing to the fact that the, the jewels are the, the things that little faith values, the things that, uh, it's, it's basically salvation. And uh, so, so, these things can take away certain things, but they can't. They can't take away salvation. You know, Christ says, "I, I give. I know my sheep. I give them eternal life, and, and no one can take it from them." And so, uh, so that's the hope that we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, um, um, but we still have these attacks, and if we give in to them, if we have little faith, you know, we can lose assurance of salvation. We can lose, uh, you know, a lot surrounding our salvation, and and that's what is is being being taken. And so I, the probably the clearest example of <coughs> this difference is Esau. Who what did he do? He sold his birthright. That picture of of the heavenly inheritance, and why did he sell it? Because he really loved the things of this world. What good is that if I die? And and that's that's the picture of no faith. The picture of little faith is you can't you can't get the jewels. You can't take that certificate to the celestial city. And so um, and so little faith. While well, he's attacked, he keeps his jewels, but he really struggles through the rest of his way. And uh, and then the other contrast that comes out in the book is that um, that that not only is there a contrast between little faith and no faith, but there's a contrast between little faith and then the robbers run off when they hear somebody because they think it's great grace, great grace. And he's one who kind of pictures somebody who has great faith. And, and that's kind of the, the heroes that we see in the Bible, King David, Peter, Paul. And, uh, and that's where we see little faith, in great grace, these these warriors of the king, uh, who've gone before us, they they both have faith, but but there's a big difference between them. But that difference is 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 not fundamental, like between little faith and no faith. And even the great warriors, they have great scars. They have, and it's pointing to the fact that they have sin. You know, David. Man after God's own heart, um, yet stole a man's wife, killed the man who was a loyal soldier to him. You know, a huge issue. Um, Peter, who who told Christ that you know, I'll never, I'll never leave you. I'll never go away. And, and yet denied him three times the last time to a, a little servant girl and uh and so that that fear just took over in his life and and so you see that little faith and in, in great grace these warriors none of them are christ who has no sin um 
but the, the, the warriors who follow Christ are the great warriors and exercise greater strength, greater faith. And, and that's where the Christian really is pointing hopeful, saying, what are the things we can do to, to be on guard? What are the things we can do? And, and fundamentally, it's what? Put on our spiritual armor, which is what BBS is going to be all about in three weeks. <clears throat> and so, uh, and, you know, what is that? Put on faith. Know the word of God. Pursue the word of God. Pursue the presence of God. I thought that was a great emphasis of the lesson is, you know, uh, Psalm 23. How did he, how did King David make it through the, the valley of the shadow of death? You know, I know you're with me. Your, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Um, Moses refused to go into the promised land, even though he'd have the glories of this life. Land flowing with milk and honey, but yet what? He says, "No, if you if you don't go with us, it's no good." And you know that's what we need. And so, uh, so anyway, so this story is just a great emphasis or, or pointing us back to to trust in Christ, walking in what faith and obedience, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in the in the Lord. And so then from there. They come to a fork in the road. So if you see a fork in the road, take it. You know? um, and so the fork in the road, they're debating which way do we go. And so they end up going. They can't decide. And then somebody comes. And he's in a white robe, looks good, sounds authoritative, turns out to be the flatterer. And uh, But the big thing to catch here is this, is that when they came to the fork in the road, they tried to figure things out on their own. They didn't go to the instructions that the shepherds gave. They didn't go to the word of God. They tried to figure out things on their own. And this is this is the, the big thing to see is, is how important is it for us when we come to uh, issues in life that we need to determine what does God's word say? Like, you know, like that should be the first thing we go to, not, you know, can I figure this out on my own? You know, you know. How, how do I how do I deal with this situation? Um, and so they end up neglecting God's word, neglecting that instruction. And then this guy comes and he seems good, seems like he has authority, looks good. So they follow him. And then uh, all of a sudden he leads them into a net. They get ensnared. And then uh, uh, his robe comes off and it's, it's seen that he's very clearly a minion of Satan. And so, um, you know, he's Bunyan has drawn off uh, uh, the Proverbs that talk about the flatterer, how he uh, entraps and snares his neighbor. Uh, tried to explain to the kids the difference between complimenting and, and flattering. And they, just so you guys understand, they understood it very clearly. Um, that flattering, I mean, this is like from them. And I, you know, was going to go there anyway, but they all pretty much resoundly understood that flattery is when you're trying to butter up your mom and dad to try to get them to 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 uh, let you do something you want to do. In other words, a compliment is something you give somebody else for their good. Flattery is something you give to other people because you're trying to get something. A lot. Let me just tell you, all the kids, it, you know, all to the youngest, they understood this. And um, and so, but anyway, so the flatterer, they leave. And so, um, and again, so here we see the grace of God, because what do they do? Um, Christian and hopeful, they cry out. I mean, what can they do? They're stuck in a net. It's their sin that's brought them here. They're off the, away from the. The, the way to the celestial city. And so they, they cry out to God. And so God sends a shining one who cuts the net. Uh, an angel frees them and then beats them. I mean, that's the old school version, but it disciplines them. And, I, and again, spend some time talking about how discipline is of love. And most of the kids seem to really understand that, but just want to make sure. Uh, you guys understand that, you know, had some discussion on that. 
And um, but the point is, is, is that Christ's desire is is for us to be zealous to repent. We looked at Revelation three about how there, here's this church, Laodicea, they're lukewarm, and Christ says, "Be be zealous, repent." And what? And and I'll open the door. You can come and and we'll eat together. A knock at the door. And so <clears throat> the point is, God's desire is for us to to pursue his presence, to pursue him. And uh, in Christian and hopeful, while they neglected God's word, it led them into the flatter, they, they, they uh, had issues there. They what? When they did sin, they, they immediately repented and called out. And, and that, that relationship was restored because there was true repentance. And so, um, um, so from there then, they get back on the, the, the way, and they get going, and they meet a guy coming the wrong way. And this, this man's name is Atheist. So several of the kids, the younger kids, didn't know what Atheist meant, so kind of explain that. Um, um, but really tried to emphasize how Atheist, you know, believing, you know, the Bible says uh, multiple places that the fool says in his heart there is no God. And really tried to emphasize to the kids that um, that that atheism is 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 not a a problem of intellect. Um, you know they're stupid, they're a fool in that intellectual way, but it's a problem of morality. And I know the older kids that I teach all the time with apologetics know this, but the younger kids, this is a new concept, so be a good one to follow up on but like ephesians 4 17 that unbelievers function in the, the futility of their minds romans 1 um, talking about becoming fools and so the point is 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 when people pursue atheism the, the idea that there is no god and frankly those diehard atheists believe there is no god and they hate them which makes no sense but that points to the fact that they know there's a god um, and atheism comes out of a, a moral vacuum, not an intellectual vacuum. It comes out of a desire to do and live how they want to. And uh, in, in, indeed, that's what those those texts teach us. And um, and so uh, with um, the the atheist, the fundamental problem is that is they need to repent. And so this a atheist, you know, who's the next flatterer. And this time, hopeful, he's like, because Christian kind of wavers, and I was like, is, is what atheist saying? Atheist says there's no such thing as the king, there's no such thing as the celestial city. Christian says, is this true? And hopeful goes right to the word of God. No, no, I'm not, you know. So they've learned their lesson. They're going to hold strong, hold fast to the word of God, pursue him and his presence. Uh, the atheist is very interesting. He says, after 20 years of searching, I'm leaving. I'm going back because there's no such thing. And he says, I'm going back to live how I want to live. And um, um, so, I'm, again, he's going back, what? To pursue his own sin, which is majority of the time the fundamental issue with atheism. He said, he mocks them and says, you know, you guys are stupid and dumb if you're going to believe this. You're going to, you're wasting your lives. You're doing so obviously these are huge issues in our culture today. So I didn't spend a lot of time on it with the kids, but I, I certainly introduced it to them. And so feel free, you know, well, they're your kids, so do whatever you want. But I would encourage you to feel free to follow up on, on that to the level that you feel your kids are, because um, um, it's just such a big issue for us in our day and age of deconstruction and such. So. Um, so hopefully that was an encouragement, helpful to you guys. Talk to you next week.